Praise the name of the Lord. This is Pastor LaShawn of Kingdom Impact Ministries. We are excited that you are joining us today. Get your Bibles ready. Get your notebook and your pen as we prepare to go into the Word of God. We pray that you will be blessed and that it will stir you up and stir up faith in you like never before. God bless and enjoy the Word of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. This is Kingdom Impact Ministries, and we are glad to be in the house of the Lord today. We are glad for you that are online. The Bible says, let everything that what has breath praise ye the Lord. And we are glad to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wonderful is the name of Jesus. Well, today is a good day to give God praise. Every day is a good day to give God praise. If you are able to walk, you are able to talk, you have food to eat, you are able to give God a praise. Hallelujah. And for that, we give God all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Hallelujah. So, Father, we just thank you for today. We give your name all the glory, the honor, and the praise. We thank you for the word that is about to go forward. We pray, God, that it will meet the needs of your people, God. That, Father, they will find something out of the word and hear it that will stir up their faith, that they will be able to move into a place that you're calling them to move into. And so, Lord, we thank you for the word that it will come forward, that it will come with power, it will come with change, it will come with authority, and it will come unhindered and unchecked, and it will come in the power of Jesus Christ. And so we thank you today, and we bless your name, and the people said, amen. amen. Let's give everybody a, a praise for being here today, and for our online people. What a blessing, what a blessing. This is good to be in the house of the Lord today. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord. That's one thing that you can't ever not have is coming into the house of the Lord. I know they're trying to create all types of things so that you don't come into the house of the Lord. But the word clearly says, come into the house of the Lord. I know they got metaverse where you can create your own avatar to get in the midst of the service and you can greet and hug everybody. But it's nothing like saying, good morning, Mama Jackson. Good morning, Sister Mildred. Good morning, Brother Joshua. Good morning, Sister Tamaya. Good morning, Brother Keeney. Good morning, Pastor Marvin. It's nothing like saying good morning when you come in. Amen? It's nothing like being able to see the smiles of the people that we will all come together to feel the presence of the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. Metaverse can't give you that. I say that again. Metaverse can't give you that. It, it, it can't give you the good morning back. It, it can't give you the tap on the shoulder. Guess what? Metaverse can't even tell you what you're going through. Hallelujah. But when you come into the house of the Lord, somebody should be able to see. I see the devil trying to whip you up right there. But I'm going to stand in the gap for you on today, and I'm going to push the devil back. Come on, somebody. Metaverse can't do that. Hallelujah. There's no substitution for the presence of God. There's no substitution. No matter what you try and do, you cannot substitute God. A man can't substitute him. A girlfriend can't substitute him. A wife, a husband can't substitute. You got to have God. Hallelujah. Mama Jackson then made it over 80 plus years with God. Hallelujah. She's still in her right mind. She's still moving. She's still talking. She's still showing up to church. She's still letting the Lord use her. Guess what? We ought to be able to move in that same place. Glory be to God. See, when you come to the house of the Lord, you should be like a, a, a charge. Just put your battery, just plug it right on in. Say, I'm about to get some more juice when I come up in this thing. I don't know what it was. It's just like pulling into the gas station. When you're almost out, you got to pull up to the station so that you can get a fill up. Hallelujah. And when you come to the house of God, somebody ought to say, fill me up, God. I don't care if you don't have a tank. Fill me up, God. Let it overflow. See, you know when the gas overflows because it starts spitting back at you to let you know, hey, 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 we got more than enough. We ought to have so much overflowing in us to when we get into the house of the Lord, whoever comes in can get their feet wet when they sit next to me. Oh, come on now. I ought to be dripping so much. 
to somebody to say, man, why is your seat so wet? It's because I'm dripping with the oil of God. It's because I'm dripping with a fresh flow from God. And if you want some of this oil, let me touch you so that you can get some of my overflow. Hallelujah. But if you come in so dry, they're going to look and say, well, you about as dry as I am. So let's both plug into what God is trying to do. Amen. Hallelujah. When you come into the house of the Lord, you should have a smile. You should have a smile because you made it. Hallelujah. You made it to the house of the Lord. You, you ought to be glad because when you come here, you are in expectation that God is going to meet you when you come into place. Hallelujah. You should, even if you had a frown from somebody cutting you off, but the minute when you get to the door, you should say, Woo, I made it. Hallelujah. It did nothing stop me. My mind was made up. I was going to get here with you or without you. I was coming. And guess what? You got to come with your own praise. Hallelujah. Sometimes they won't play your favorite song. But guess what? When you driving in the car, you can play your favorite song. And you can put it on repeat. If you want to hear it 15 times, go on and repeat it. That's a song between you and the Lord. Hallelujah. When you get here, you can share that song. Amen. And you can share it by releasing a praise in the atmosphere. Hallelujah. I am still talking about faith over fear. But before we go into the word, there's something that we say here at Kingdom Impact Ministries. I'm going to advise you to go ahead and get a screenshot of this. If you're looking at it online, screenshot it. You should be saying this to yourself every single day. If you say it to yourself for the next 30 30 days, you will begin to see God move in your life. But not just move in your life, but you're going to have to do what it say in there. Hallelujah. You're going to have to pick up the word and do what it says. And let's read it together. It says, the word will never die. It is a living word, and the word will live in me. I will become fruitful. I will multiply. I will replenish what is lacking in my life. I will subdue the earth with the word and power of God. I will live a lifestyle of faith that moves things from the unseen to the seen. The word of God will never fail. The word of God will never fail. Now that's a place to give God praise right there. Hallelujah. Today, as I continue in the series over faith over fear, I'm going to be talking about the wilderness is a part of the plan. The wilderness is a part of the plan. Most people want to avoid the wilderness, but you can't avoid the wilderness. Even Jesus had to go through the wilderness, and we'll be talking about that in a moment. Now, let me break this down for you. The wilderness, by definition, it is an uncultivated, uninhibited, and inhospitable region, meaning there's nothing that can grow in that area. When you go through a wilderness, it's a dry place. Uh, uh, it's, it's a place where nothing can grow. But the Cambridge defines wilderness as an area of land that has not been used to grow crops or has towns and roads built on it, especially because it is difficult to live in as a result of its extreme cold or heat weather, meaning it's a bad part of the earth where no man can live. So when you think about that, everybody's trying to fly out to Mars. They're trying to find somewhere else to live outside of earth. But God released his breath upon earth, so this is where he want us to be. If he would have wanted us to be on Mars, Venus, and Saturn, we would be on planet Mars, Venus, and Saturn. But where he put us at was uh, here on earth. Hallelujah. And where he gave us the authority and the dominion is where? It's on earth. It's not in Saturn. He's giving you the authority on the earth. Amen. Let's look at our scripture, Exodus 16 and verse number three. We're talking about the wilderness is part of the plan. In verse number three of Exodus 16 and three, it says, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they mourned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. 
But now you have brought us into what? This wilderness to starve us all to death. Let's go on over to Deuteronomy 8 and 2. It says, remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness mm -hmm. for these 40 years. How long did he lead them? For 40 years. Humbling what? You and testing you to prove what? Your character. And to find out whether or not you would what? You would what? Obey his commands. My God today. He, he takes you through wilderness to see if you will obey his commands. I want to start off by putting this out here. The children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt. They were in bondage to Egypt, and then God sent Pharaoh, God sent Moses to go speak to Pharaoh on their behalf so that they could come out. And when he brought them out, this is over a course of time that the children of Israel always seem to find a complaint. Amen. They always seem to murmur and complain and want to go back from what God had brought them from. When we look at the first scripture in Exodus 16 and 3, they said, listen, they moan and complain against Moses and against Aaron saying, hey, you brought us out here in the wilderness to die. You know, back in Egypt, I had plenty to eat. I had plenty for me to be able to go eat and go drink. But the thing about it is you was under bondage. It is amazing how the devil will make you forget the bondage that you was under. It is amazing how the devil will tell you and show you in your mind that it was better in Egypt than what it is serving the Lord. But see, when you get to a point in your walk with God, you come to find out that it ain't nothing that's going to turn me around. I believe that I'm going to keep on moving. But see, everyone has a wilderness experience. In the wilderness, you will discover several things about yourself and others as they walk through it as part of their journey. Most people hate going through wilderness. Would you agree with that? Most people hate going through wilderness or a dry place in their life because it can be hard. Amen? But often, God takes us through this route of the wilderness to show us what is really in our hearts and to discover who you will say about God. God. So see, you ought to begin to think about the plan that God has in your life for the wilderness. Because when you get in the wilderness, that's where you're going to find out what you're really going to say. When you get in a tough situation, what's in you is going to come out. See, the wilderness, somebody say the wilderness. The wilderness has a built-in personal lesson plan designed to purify your hearts, minds, and souls. So when you're going through the wilderness, it's not just for me, it's for you. It's your own personalized plan that God has. What's in you will come out. See, most people repeat the same level of wilderness. I'm going to say that again. Most people repeat the same level of wilderness because they don't learn the lessons and the revelations that God has intended for them to gain from the wilderness. You say, well, how could that be true? The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, meaning they kept walking around the same place every so often, at least one time out of 365 days, they came right back to the same place. When God puts you in a wilderness, then you have to say, what is the revelation that God is trying to show me? Amen. See, most people don't realize that the wilderness is where you have to test your survival skills. Ah, see, the wilderness brings out your survival skills. Well, what is your survival skills? Your survival skills is your test and your trials. Your test and your trials help to build you up so when you are going through your wilderness, you will know how to get through it. Hallelujah. See, you might not know the full plan when you're in the wilderness, but you should have an idea of how to get through the wilderness. Well, when you are going through the wilderness, you will find out how much word you really know. 
Hallelujah. When you're going through the wilderness, you'll find out if you really do trust what you have been reading. You will really find out if I have an, an effective prayer life while I'm in the wilderness. See, you'll find out how strong your mind really is in the wilderness. In the wilderness is where most people quit. But some people quit in the test and the trial. But the wilderness comes to shift you to the next level of where God wants to take you. Hallelujah. See, when you go through the wilderness, you got to know there's a shift of anointing that's coming on your life. See, you got to go through a dry place to appreciate the good stuff. Hallelujah. But see, when you are always looking for the good of the land, I remember there was a time when I had to eat Vienna sausages out of the can. Come on, somebody. It, it wasn't the best meal to eat, but it was something to eat just to satisfy my hunger. But I'll tell you right now, they can bring the Vienna sausages down to 15 cents a can, and I ain't going to pick up one because I had enough when I was over in Egypt. Hallelujah. It wasn't nothing good about eating Vienna sausages over in Egypt. Not at all. I, I, I have to walk right past it because I don't want that no more. In fact, I don't even know what it's made out of. It's the parts of the pig that the pig that can't even be used of. So the Vienna sausage come with a, a jelly jam on top of it. Hallelujah. But when you're hungry, you get a cracker with it, Baba Jackson. And you, and you put you put on the cracker, you get the Vienna sausage, and you go ahead and eat it with the jelly jam all on it. But see, when I think about meals like that, it reminds me of Egypt. And I don't want no Egypt no more in my life. I don't want no residue of Egypt in my life. And you got to say to yourself, my wilderness, I don't want to keep going through the same level of wilderness. Amen? Hallelujah. You got to get to the point of after a while, I want some fried chicken. I, I don't want a drumstick. Drumsticks, you can get about 200 of them for $3.75. But oh, when you get to the white meat, you only get about five for $19.95. But see, when you come out of your wilderness, you say, I paid a $19.95. Why? Because the white meat tastes a little bit better than the dark meat. But it, it, it's okay when you go through the wilderness but you can't stay in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Say everyone has a wilderness experience. Did you not know that the Boy Scouts, that you got to earn your merit badge? There is over 136 badges that you can earn to be a Boy Scout. But guess what I found out here? That in the midst of that, they got to have a prerequisite before they can get that badge. They got to go in and take the test if there's a test to take. They got to go in and apply their hands to it in order for them to be able to get that badge. I began to think, I said, well, why do they give out the badges? This is their code that they have. They said here that they are meant to teach you a variety of skills that will be useful and interesting to you uh, beyond your time in the scouts. Mm -hmm. A small number of scouts have accomplished the lofty goal of earning every single merit, meaning that if you want to get all 136 merit badges, they say it's going to take you up to three years to get it. In order for you to be able to get that marriage badge, that means that your mind got to be focused that I intend to get it all. But one of the things that I found out here, they also have 12 principles of the scouts. I thought it was very interesting that everybody has a principle or a culture that they want to live by just by what God gave us as well. But what I found is that when you become a boy scout or a girl scout, they are expecting you to commit to that way. Even when you don't have on their uniform, they're still effect, expecting you to do what you have been taught. Let's take a look at the 12 principles of the Boy Scouts. A scout is trustworthy. What? Not the scouts. The scouts are trustworthy. They are loyal. What? Helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, Thrifty, brave, 
clear and relevant. Now, when I got to relevant, I said, wait a minute. The Boy Scouts say we relevant, meaning we got a purpose for being here and we're relevant in whatever we do. See, one of the things that they teach, that they teach the Boy Scouts is for them to be able to be useful in your community. Y'all going to catch that later. See, God wants you to be useful in the world. See, they are only limited to the community. But when it says to be thrifty, I have to look that up to see why do they say thrifty? Most of the times when you think of thrifty, you think of a stingy, cheap person. Am I right about it? But see, when you look at the definition of thrifty, it says it means a person or their behavior using money and other resources carefully. Ah, see, you got to use the resources carefully that you not be wasteful. Well, when I think about that, the all that God has put on my life, I got to be thrifty with it. I just can't go around pouring it all out on everybody. You say, well, that ain't right. Oh, let's take a look at the 10 virgins. The Bible says that five had a bunch of oil and five didn't hardly have no oil at all. What did the ones with no oil say? They went over to the virgins and they said, hey, can we have some of your oil? But they said, no, nah, you need to go get your own oil. See, there's a time in your life where you got to get you some oil. And the wilderness is designed for you to get your oil. Hallelujah. You can't run away from it. You have to press through and go through it. Amen. See, you have two options of going through the wilderness. Somebody say two options. You can go with God or you can go without him. We have all experienced going without them. Everybody in the room and online has been through the wilderness without God. And if I can be a testimony, I will tell you it ain't no fun. I will tell you that it's a struggle over there when you're doing it without God. Now I understand why he says that the ways of the transgressor is hard. Because when you are not doing it the way that God wants you to do it, it gets hard over there. You, you, you're going to do some sweating by your brow. You're going to do and go through some personal perseverance on that side without God. But when you have God, my God, he will lead you and he will guide you all the way. In the wilderness plan. I, I want you to write down the wilderness plan. Uh, it's three things that I want you to take note of here in the wilderness plan. Number one, what's in your heart? The wilderness plan wants to reveal what's in your heart. Number two, what are you saying when you in the wilderness? Hallelujah. Number three, who are you bowing down to when you in the wilderness? See, when you go through the wilderness, you're going to have some options. Come on, somebody. You, you're going to have some options when you go through this wilderness, but you got to know that God is looking to see if you're going to choose the right option. This is not like the price is right where you take a guess at it, you got to know I'm going to choose God all the way. See, let's take a look here of people that had to go through the wilderness. It's three examples. The first one is the children of Israel. If we have to look at the scripture, we can see where they exercise absolutely no faith. Absolutely no faith, and we can see where fear was exercised. See, in the scripture, and as we're doing this service here, and as we're doing this particular series, we're talking about faith over fear. You find so many times that the children of Israel walked in a great level of fear. Every time they began to get under a little bit of pressure, you would always see what was in them come out. Well, what was in them? Egypt. Somebody say Egypt. Egypt now is the world. You still got a little bit of the world in you when it comes out. When time gets hard, we always go back to what's familiar to us. Instead of learning a new path and a new place of where God is trying to take you to. See, the children of Israel here in Deuteronomy 8 and 2, as we read earlier, he, he, he says here that it was a purpose for humbling you and testing you to prove your character. Many times when you're going through the wilderness, God is trying to prove your character. 
Hallelujah. Our character has flaws in it. Our character will display if we lie. Sometimes we lie and don't even have to lie. You can say, hey, I seen you driving down the street. No, that wasn't me. Well, you had on a red shirt, a white hat. You had your glasses leaning to the side. You had a Starbucks cup in your hand. And then you're like, well, I did have that on, but no, that wasn't me. Well, you just lied for no reason. A lot of times we lie to God and say, that we're going to do something and we never do it because we get so familiar and so accustomed to saying what we will do and never do it. Come on, somebody. See, the children of Israel, they always came to a point of where they started complaining. You got to ask yourself, every time I get to a hard point, do I always start complaining? What starts coming out of my mouth? Is it the word of God that I'm using to push it back or am I still moving? as one of the children of Israel. See, God had brought them to a great place. Hallelujah. God can bring you to great places in your life. But if you're not able to maintain what God wants to take you, you're going to lose it all in the moment. But you got to make up in your mind that what God gives me, I'm going to maintain it. What God puts in my hands, I'm going to keep it. And not only that, I'm going to manifest it to make it grow. Hallelujah. In the wilderness. Somebody say, in the wilderness. It, it don't feel good in the wilderness because ain't nothing growing. But there should be one thing that's growing in the wilderness. You want me to tell you what it is? It's you. You should be growing in the wilderness. You should be bringing life in your wilderness. You should be renewing your mind in your wilderness. You should be stirring up your spirit in the wilderness. You should be finding the will of God in your wilderness. You should be pursuing after God with a hunger and thirst in your wilderness. It's all over you. Somebody say, it's all on me. When you in the wilderness, hallelujah, it ain't on nobody else. It could be 10 other people there, but it's all on you. Hallelujah. We're going to look at another person that came out the wilderness. Woo! John the Baptist. Oh yeah, John the Baptist was in the wilderness. We're going to look at Mark 1, 4 through 8. It says, and the messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. Let me tell you something. People came to the church back then, too. They all came out to a designated location to hear what John had to say. I'm pretty for sure people got familiar with his message because it says here that he was preaching a message of what? Repentance. And see, when you go out to the house of God, you should hear a message of repentance every once in a while. You should hear that heaven and hell is real. You should hear that if your sins are not forgiven in hell, your eyes, you're going to find yourself lifting them up. I want to tell somebody today that hell is very real. I know people don't want to talk about it no more because they want to fill up the churches. But I'm going to talk about it today that if your life ain't lining up and moving where God wants you to be in hell, you shall go. Hell was not a place that God ever designed for us to go. Hallelujah. But because we are rebellious and want to do our own thing, just as the devil want to do it, guess what? He got a place set up just for him. And guess what? I don't know anybody that like it getting too hot. Come on, somebody. If you turn the heat on in your house to 85 degrees, you're going to say, somebody turn the heat down. Because this thing got too hot in here. You begin to sweat. But when you are in hell, there ain't no way that you're going to be able to turn it down. Let me go ahead while I'm here. The Bible says that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know about you, but to be weeping and knowing that I could have made the decision to go in a different direction and I didn't do it, that would make me weep all the day long. Hallelujah. And guess what? Somebody say, there ain't no help coming to bail you out. You're going to be there until eternity. So guess what? I'll go through the little hell that I'm going through now because this right here is only for just a little while. Let me keep on going here. And when they confess their sins, 
when they confessed their sins, uh, uh, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. Uh huh. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. So he had on camel's hair, something that I realized here the water could roll off his back. Uh huh. That means sometimes when you get in the church and you start preaching a hard gospel, the water got to roll off your back. Uh, it can't stick on there because you got to keep moving through. And if you can imagine that he's preaching that you have to move away from your sins and repent, guess what? Sometimes people probably wanted to pick up some stones and throw them at him. Verse number seven, it says, someone is coming. This is what John announced to the people. Someone is coming who is greater than I. So much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. But I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's go ahead and take a look at this right here. When you come out of your wilderness, you should be ready to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you come out of your wilderness, you should have a word in your mouth to tell people that, hey, Jesus is soon to return. See, I looked at something. He said his diet was of locusts and wild honey, which lets me know you can't just be eating every old thing. You got to ask God when you start consecrating yourself, what do you need me to turn away from? Because guess what? If you eat the wrong thing, it can shift your whole mood. Hallelujah. Have you ever had a hamburger and after you ate the hamburger, you get sleepy all of a sudden? Why is that? It's because the food didn't weighed you down. So if you are eating too much at nighttime. How can God wake you up? He can't because you fool. You said you can't even be full. Your mind is full. He can't speak to you in your dreams. You're so busy that God can't even speak to you. But not only are you busy in your mind, you're full in your spirit with the natural stuff. And, and see, when you get that all natural stuff out of you and you get the spiritual stuff in you, then you're able to go where God wants you to go. Amen. See, when you come out of the wilderness, you're your faith should be built up. The wilderness also brings about for you to be built up. There is a plan for your wilderness. Hallelujah. Next, we're going to look at Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, and that's over uh, uh, in the scripture here. It says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit. Uh-huh. Matthew 4. It says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Who was he going to be tempted by? By the devil. So when you get into the wilderness, guess what? The devil going to be waiting there for you too. Hallelujah. Well, every time you get ready to go on a fast, guess what? Who shows up? Your flesh. Your flesh shows up and say, you know you're hungry right now. Well, you only been on the fast for five minutes. You, you, you just got started. Now, all of a sudden, you want some orange juice. You don't even drink orange juice in the morning. All of a sudden, you want a cup of coffee. You ain't even a coffee drinker. All of a sudden, you want a honey bun. Come on, somebody. Let's tell the truth up in here. I didn't been there. I, I don't even drink coffee like that. But all of a sudden, I said, ooh, it would sure be nice to have a cup of coffee. You don't need no coffee. You need to crucify this flesh. Now, I'm going to go back and read it again. It says, then Jesus was led by who? He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights as he fasted and became very hungry. Mm -hmm. See, the devil came during the times Jesus was in the wilderness. See, when you're going through your testing, your trials, those are times that are you are in the wilderness that the enemy is going to come. See, you got to realize that there are times when God is going to lead you to go into the wilderness. Hallelujah. See, if you read the scripture, it says, and right away he went 
after he was baptized, right away he went. And see, when you look at the word of God, you got to know that there are some things that's going to come right away. Verse number three, during that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell those stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scripture says, People do not live by bread alone, uh huh, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So many of us are not allowing the word of God to come out of our mouth. We eating bread, all right. We eating toasted bread, butter bread, jelly bread, all types of bread, 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 and more bread, honey bread, corn bread, sweet bread, Hawaiian bread, whatever kind of bread we are filled up on the bread of this world and not the bread of life. We're not filled up on Jesus and he's coming now to say, you got to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. See, here's the thing that most people don't understand. When you take in the word of God, the devil don't know who's really talking. Because you using God's word. It is the same word that he uses against him. So guess what? When you get in tests and trials, you got to use the word of God. You can't use I feel. You got to use the word says. Hallelujah. Verse number five. Then the devil took him to the holy city of Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on the stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to a peak of a high mountain and show he and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you kneel down and worship me. In verse number 10, he says, get out of here, Satan. See, that's the thing. Too many people listening to him. And while you're listening to him, you start believing what he's saying. But he said, get out of here, Satan. Jesus told him, but the scripture says, you must what? You must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. Now let's take a look at here. Three things begin to happen when Jesus went into the wilderness. Number one, you will see that the devil said, listen, turn this bread, turn these stones into bread. What he was trying to do is get him to be dominated by his senses. Too many of us are dominated by our senses, what we can see, what we feel, and what we hear, and what we touch. But you got to move out of the place of the natural, and you got to move into the place of the spirit to where the spirit is what's dominating over you. See, the lust of the flesh, the flesh is always going to want something. Hallelujah. The flesh is always going to want to keep pushing you to another place. See, then the devil took him to the highest point and said, jump. There are places in your life where the devil will tell you to jump. Jump out of position with God. Jump into this. Jump into that without you ever consulting God. And lastly, he took him to a high place, a high mountain, and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory, that this all could be yours. See, there are things that God will show you that you can have all of this if you just bow down to me. See, the pride of life is thinking that you are special. It's thinking because of who you are, I got the proud look upon myself. What you have and what you know. See, the pride of life, you can think you got it all going on. You can think that you know it all. And see, the pride of life, it has a spirit on it. If you're looking at people, you can tell who walking in the spirit. If you look at people with your spiritual eyes, you can tell when people are confused. If you're looking at it with your spiritual eyes, you can tell when the devil is just sitting up on them. Because guess what? In your natural mind, when you're walking in God, there's no reason to frown. Why? Because God has paid and made a way for everything that you could ever think of. See, the enemy uses these three things in your life. He uses the lust of the flesh, the lust of the 
eyes and the pride of life to entice you to sin. But let me tell you something, that each and every part of our lives, we're going to get tempted in one of these areas. I got a news flash to let everybody know that he ain't going to come to you outside of those areas. Hallelujah. He going to come to you right there. See, you have to ask yourself in every test that you go through, am I walking in faith or am I walking in fear? You got to always ask yourself that. See, faith will always push you to be where God has called you to be. Hallelujah. Faith will not allow you to stay in one place. Because if you stay in one place, you become stagnant and you get stuck. Hallelujah. You're wondering, well, how did I get stagnant? Well, do you ask God to give you something new? What has God done new for you? What have you asked God to do new in you? Hallelujah. See, faith is always pushing you to go to the next level. Faith is always pushing you to go to a different realm and dimension because you can't get comfortable where you are. Give the Lord a praise right there. Hallelujah. The problem with being comfortable is that you won't move. The problem with being comfortable is that you'll stay in the right place. Even an eagle know how to kick the little eaglets out. Amen? He, he, he knows to go in and to, to make the, the nest uncomfortable. Put a little bit of thorns in there. Because as long as it's comfortable, the little eaglets going to stay in there. They might be called something else, but for today's message, we're going to call them the baby eaglets. Hallelujah. Because see, if it's always comfortable and when the mother knows that it's time to kick them out and allows the little baby eaglet to stay in there too long, they're going to miss the time. But when their wings are supposed to spread out. Hallelujah. Too many times people stay past the point and where they are not moving where God wants them to move. See, you got to find out, Lord, have I been here too long? It's a self-check. Have I been in this place too long? I'm not seeing the godly results of multiplication on my life. And if you ain't seeing multiplication, you got to do a check on yourself. Hallelujah. It's easy to get into a routine. It's easy to do the same thing. It's easy to walk in the same pattern. But after a while, you got to shake yourself. You got to come to your senses. You got to say, hey, what's going on with me, Mildred? What's going on with me, LaShawn? I got to get up from this place. If I don't have the fire that I used to have when I pray, then something is wrong. Hallelujah. If your prayers have been dwindled down to if this is your bed, Father, I just want to. And you done went back to sleep. You didn't even get out, Father. I want to thank you before you were asleep. My God, my God. You pray in the bed of comfort. But God has to bring adversity to get you to move. Some of us only move when the fire comes. Some of us only get to where God wants us to get when the fire comes. And then when the fire is not turned up, we go right on back. Why? Because we didn't understand the revelation and what God is trying to do. See, faith will do what? Push you. Hallelujah. If you don't feel the hands of faith pushing you and stirring you up, then something is going on. You got to unplug the drain. My God. Hallelujah. You got to unplug it. I don't know about anybody. Back in the old days, you had to get a stopper to put the water in there. Amen. And if you let the water stay in there too long, it'll start stinking after a while. Uh, it'll go from being hot to being cold. Am I right about it? See, you can take hot water and put it in the refrigerator. After a while, it's going to do what? It's going to get cold. And guess what? A lot of us is hanging around cold people. And when you're hanging around cold people and you was hot, you bound to get cold yourself. Hallelujah. But you need to get around somebody that's hot. And if it ain't a person, you need to get around the Holy Ghost. He got plenty of fire to get you going. Hallelujah. See, when we don't realize we sleep in our spirit. We sleep. The devil's always rubbing us. Go to sleep right here. You don't need to hear this. You don't need to do that. But when you realize I got to shake myself 
And I got to move from this place. See, fear is always telling you of your limitations. Stay right here. Don't go beyond that. You can't move out there. But guess what? When you start moving, the Holy Ghost will give you a bonus to do what God has called you to do. Hallelujah. And many of us got to ask ourselves, how bold do I want to be for Christ? See, I'm finding out the more I keep pastoring and the more that I keep walking with the God, it's a hard issue. See, a lot of times people's heart ain't right before God. Because when your heart gets right before God, there's nothing that you're not willing to do for the Lord. When he said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, meaning you got to find out what is acceptable before God. You got to find out what is the reasonable service that I can give God. Hallelujah. See, you got to think about what God is calling you to because the wilderness has a plan for your life and you can't avoid the wilderness. You got to go through the wilderness. Amen. Uh, I read something here about the prepper.com, how to survive in the wilderness. They had 21 things, but I only cut down to show you uh, a few things that you need that I thought was very interesting. I, I come to find that a lot of people are using godly principles to move in their businesses and things. But, but we don't take the principles of God and apply them to our lives for us to move into the places that God wants us to be. Hallelujah. Number one, you got to prepare to be uncomfortable. This is what it said. I, I only wrote down 10 things, and I'm going to share the 10 that I thought was good out of the 21. Yeah, yeah, I can write it down and give it to you because these are the ones that I thought stuck out. Number one, you got to prepare to be uncomfortable. The wilderness is not a place where you're supposed to pitch your tent. Hallelujah. You ain't supposed to pitch your tent there. It is a wilderness for you to go through it. If you look at Psalms 23 and 4, write that scripture down. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff that comfort me, which means God is leading you through the wilderness. Hallelujah. You can't get comfortable being in the wilderness. It's not meant for you to get comfortable, but people make it comfortable. Hallelujah. Number two, you got to pack for the unexpected. My, my, my. You got to pack for the unexpected. You got to have a whosoever shall separate me mentality when you get in the wilderness. Your mentality has to be nothing shall separate me from the Lord. Where is that at, preacher? Well, Romans 8 and 35. It says, who shall separate us from the love of God or from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or a sword. See, Paul is telling you here that when you are going through this wilderness, no matter how hard it might be, no matter how tough it might be, you should not allow it to separate you from Christ. That is the only thing that the devil is trying to do. He's trying to move you out of position from being what God needs you to be. But when you come to that place and you say, nothing is going to separate me, no no persecution, no distress, none of those things is going to separate me. Number three, always carry emergency communication. I thought that was interesting. In other words, you got to find somebody that can stand in agreement with you. If you look over at Matthew 8 and 20, it talks about two of you coming to agreement. And when you come into agreement, who's going to show up? God's going to show up. But see, when you ain't got an emergency communication, see, your prayer partner ought to be able to carry their own weight in the spirit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't come leaning all on me. Hallelujah. You got to be able to carry your portion too because guess what? When you get in a spot, I need to be able to help push with you. Ah, uh, I said push with you. See, I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. I'm going to push with you, meaning you are pushing. I'm going to get behind you and I'm going to push with you. 
I'm going to say that again. I, you pushing, and I'm going to get behind you, and I'm going to push with you. Why? Because when there's two pushing together, we are pushing the enemy back. Hallelujah. I help my husband push a truck occasionally, and, 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 and I got to get in the back. And sometimes it might be too hard. And guess what? We got to call out the two sons to come and help us push it up. And if Sister Tamaya is over there, she got to get on the back end too because the truck is too heavy. Sometimes there are things that come in your life that is too heavy, and you got to grab one, two, three, or four people to help you push along. But if you don't open up your mouth and say, I need some help to push through this rough spot, you're going to find yourself without the communication. See, another thing that you got to realize, you can't overpack in the wilderness. Don't overpack. Yeah, you got to have the mentality that this too shall pass. I'm going to say that again. This too shall pass. See, when you get in the wilderness and you overpack, that means you got a whole bunch of extra cans of Vienna sausages because you know you're going to be there a while. You went and got you some, some uh, uh, pork and beans, and you went and got you some saltine crackers, and you went and got you some Kool-Aid because we're going to be here a while. See, when you get in that place and you start setting up your meal table and you get your candle lights and you say, well, we're about to eat our last meal right here, and when you start setting it up. You got to realize, hey, I done made a table in the wilderness. I done made two chairs in the wilderness, meaning I didn't came here to sit here. And you can tell when you're sitting in the wilderness too long because your mind start thinking like Egypt. Uh, what you begin to eat start tasting good all over again. I guarantee you, if I bought you some Fianna sausage, it ain't going to taste the way it did when you were seven years old. It ain't going to taste the way that it did when you was 12 years old. Why? Because your taste buds have changed. Hallelujah. See, let me show you something. See, it says don't overpack. Write down this scripture, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. It says, for this light affliction, it says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, you got to take your eyes off of the things that you are looking at. But at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. Everything that you're going through is temporal. This ain't nothing for you to hold on to. It's going to come to pass. So even though you might be in a rough spot, the word says this is temporary. You got to get in your mind. This is temporary. We ain't always going to be small. This is only a temporary. But while you are small, get everything out that God is asking you to do. The next thing that I know. He said, you got to have a knife. Isn't that something? Even in the wilderness, you need a knife. See, when you're going through, I said, the knife, huh? The knife is a sword of the spirit. See, many of us is going through the wilderness without the sword of the spirit. And when you don't have the sword of the spirit, the devil can whip you up any old kind of way that he can. See, a knife will cut something down. A knife will chop something off. But see, when you ain't got no knife and you ain't got nothing in the wilderness, you naked. You see, when you're out there naked, you ain't got no protection. But when you got a knife and a wild beast come upon you, you better get to shaking when they come out. When the devil come at you, you better get to shaking. See, you don't know that the devil will come from many different angles. And instead of shaking them, you sitting up looking at them. See, many of us got a butter knife instead of a sword. But if you try and cut a real steak with a butter knife, you ain't going to get much progress. But they give you a steak knife. Why? Because it got ridges on it to be able to help you to cut through that meat. See, when you take the word of God and you use it as a knife to pierce through your soul, then you will find out that the word of God is moving in and moving out of you. The next thing that I noticed, number six. It said that you need some purification tablets. I thought that was interesting because the tablets come to purify the water. Hmm, what purifies the water? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. See, you have to have the purification tablets because it says it comes to kill the bacteria that's in the water. A lot of us got bacteria in our water. A lot of us got backed up things that God is trying to get out. See, it says when you can't find any fresh water. See, the word of God 
God is a fresh word. The Holy Ghost is a fresh water. And when you take and you dip from it, then you're going to get the freshness of God. Come on, somebody. It goes on here and it says, make a shelter. See, you got to make a shelter, but I don't want to be out there so long till I get comfortable with it. But I looked at it and said, make a shelter. Well, the Bible says the Lord is a shelter for the oppressed. In a time of trouble, you can run to him. That's Psalms 9 and Psalms 9 and 9. Then it says, you got to build a fire. I thought that was interesting. I said, well, Lord, where can we build a fire? Where did you tell us to build a fire? You can go to Jesus. 20 it says but you dear friends by building yourselves up in your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost see when you start praying in the Holy Ghost something starts shifting and moving in you something starts moving and making you want to move because after that it said you got to make a signal you got to make a signal and let the devil know I'm about to come up out of this thing uh, uh, you got to make a symbol. Uh, uh, what is the signal? It can be clapping your hands. What is the signal? It can be, Lord, I thank you. What is the signal that you are making? But I love number 10. It says, stay calm and make a plan. I'm going to get what I need to get, and I'm going to move on. See, you got to stay calm. Because I'm telling you, we all got to walk through a wilderness. The wilderness don't jump over the pastors. The wilderness start from the top all the way through the bottom. Even kids go through wilderness. You know, you say, well, how is that possible? You know, when a child can't seem to pass a subject, that's a wilderness in their life. You know why? Because they're not grasping what they need to get. But a praying mama know how to pray them on through. A praying mama know how to say, hey, I'm going to get you some help, whatever it might be. Amen. See, uh, uh, staying calm and making a plan. And you got to know I'm going to get through this. See, staying calm and, and you, you got to pay attention to your environment. When you're going through, you got to pay attention to see exactly what God is taking you. You got to pay attention and say, Lord, what is it that you're trying to get out of me? Amen. If, if you keep going through the same thing, you got to say, God, what are you trying to get out of me here? What am I missing? dissect yourself he'll tell you what you're missing amen he'll show you you're missing me right here and when you do that you'll respect the wilderness and you'll appreciate it they got a whole bunch of songs that say put a respect on it amen you better put some respect on this wilderness and get on through it and ask God, when you see that you're walking in the wilderness, guess what? Don't pick up nothing extra. You're supposed to go through it. Amen? Because many times when we're going through it, you got to learn how to decipher what's from God and what's from the devil. Because the devil will bring a bunch of stuff to make you think that it's God and it really ain't God. It's him disguising it as the devil. And the reason why is because we don't know God's voice. When you don't know God's voice, the devil will dump everything on you in a tender voice where you think, don't you know he talks sweet? Ask Samson about it. <laughs> See, y'all caught that. Samson, oh, she said sweet nothings. Sweet nothings. Oh, yeah. Proverbs talk about it, too. She is to talk sweet all in your ears. So the devil know how to talk sweet. But you better know, where's this sweetness coming from? Is it the devil? Because God is always going to challenge you to go where he needs you to go. Amen? You, you can't get stuck. You lay your hands on yourself. Say, I can't get stuck. I got to move. And I, I got to move fast. I got to pick up to God's pace. Hallelujah. God has a pace. Some of us ain't caught up to it yet. You better, you better get in shape. Let's get moving. Amen. Well, we pray that the word of God has been good to you. And we pray that you got something out of it, that God has a plan for your wilderness. And if you have heard this message and it's touched your heart, we pray that you would uh, uh, submit 
any information to us that you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the gospel is preached so that you can be saved. Amen? And, and there's no sense in preaching a message without an opportunity for you to repent. So if you need to repent, come on back, backslider. Come on back, new person saying, I've never received Jesus into my heart. I want to compel you to come on and say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me so that you can be the Lord and savior of my life and when you do that according to Romans 10 and 9 through 10 that if you confess with your mouth and believe that God raised Jesus from the dead you shall be saved and he'll come into your heart and if you said that prayer send us an email at the information that's at the bottom of the screen we want to thank everybody for their online giving for your in-person giving that is helping to sustain the ministry we pray to God to continue to bless you and increase you. And we will be at Bible study on Thursday at 7 p.m. at the Saver Coffee Shop. You are invited to come out. We would love to see you as God continues to move forward in Kingdom Impact Ministries. So we're going to give God a praise for all that he is doing. We thank God for the word. We thank God for everything that he is doing. And Father, we thank you for this service on today. Bless your people. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.